Hey everyone. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some coffee. My favorite spot uh, because of the people, because of the coffee beans, all the good stuff is Cafe 211 in Bentonville. If you're not in the Northwest Arkansas area though, Cafe 211 also offers their, um, their beans and their coffee mugs deliverable, I think nationwide. Um, so you can create that whole experience from your home. Mauricio Guerrero is the founder of Cafe 211. He is from Guatemala and his coffee is from Guatemala as well. There's a beautiful story that's tied to it. I encourage you to check out the Cafe 2 in 1 website. Check out Mauricio's story, the story of the coffee and the people who make it. And uh, go ahead and buy some and we can sip it together during our next conversation. And you can use the discount code CARAELVIRA10 to uh, get a 10% discount on your order. Good afternoon, Dan. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Kara. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm just so happy to be here with you on this sunny day. Um, we were just chatting about all the things that I love. And so no better place for me to be right now. I'm so happy that we're here. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so we're both uh, local Bentonville girls, which is so cool. I can't wait for the day that we get to, to meet in person. But for now, I'll introduce you to um, our audience around the world or whoever they are. This is Jan Walton, Walden, excuse me. She is a creative and crafts person. Uh, and I consider her all things wonderful and fun and her work really speaks to me. So I'm so excited to get to learn more about it today. So um, Jan, I'd love to start with understanding where your story begins or where you consider it to begin. Where did you, what did you do growing up? Was crafting always part of it or how did it come into the story? Um, crafting and art was really not a part of my life. Um, growing up, our family really put a lot of emphasis on school performance and reading, not the arts, you know, music and actually doing art. Although my mother is very, very talented. Um, I never took an art class. I never thought of myself as creative. And then I had an event and my life happened. I lost a child to suicide and part of the grieving process and unpacking everything led me to explore the creative side. It was my sister who had suggested that maybe I try yoga and maybe I try art. Uh, and I failed miserably at the yoga, but I'm really, <laughs> really having fun with the art process in, my, in the last quarter of my life. Oh my gosh. Yoga is rough. Like I love exercise. I love a good sweat with anybody, but that stuff is, that's challenging. So I get, <laughs> I would choose art too, even if it scares me because <laughs> yoga really scares me even more. <laughs> uh, I love also, I mean, in that story of, of just like your willingness to lean into new things in this time that was so, I imagine like heavy and, and maybe uncertain or confusing. Um, you mentioned that you had not had prior experience with art, right? And then you decided to lean into it. Where did you get, where do you even start? Like you just go into Michael's and like, or Hobby yeah. Lobby and pick up I a went, bunch of things? Like I went to Hobby Lobby and I bought a sketchbook and some colored pencils and I tried to draw and I couldn't draw. And I tried to imitate, you know, drawings and shapes. And I was just a miserable failure at the drawing portion of the program. But what I found I loved was the color mixing colors, shading colors, just putting, you know, putting colors together in an unconventional way. Uh, I learned the color chart and, and what that means and how colors work together. So it was, you know, kind of starting from the very, very beginning. It was like I was teaching myself of my very little basic first art class, so, but it was the color that got me hooked. And then I started exploring different mediums. Um, I bought watercolors, I bought um, acrylic paints, I bought oil paints, ooh, um, um, alcohol ink, anything that would help me work with color. So that's kind of how it started. And I did that experimenting for about four or five years. I don't think I've ever heard it articulated that like color was the motivation. And I think that's so special. Um, I'm always trying to learn something new in these conversations. Could you tell me a little bit about 
was the color wheel you mentioned and like what you, how do you use that? Like, what does that, what does that matter? Well, I mean, you've got your, it, it's so basic. You have your primary colors <laughs> and just how um, the different relationships between the colors you can have, you know, analogous colors. I, it was just, it was just fascinating to me. And that I didn't know that certain colors had different saturation points. And so in painting, certain paints will lay down in more of a translucent manner. Some are much heavier with a, a, a mat, like non-translucent. So it was just the learning of that. I've forgotten most of it when I was experimenting with it early on. But again, it was just the color that fascinated with me. Oh, I love that. And you mentioned some different types of, of material and paints, and most of them I've heard of, but alcohol paint? It's alcohol ink. It's ink. an, <laughs> right. Um, there, are, there are actually art markers, a company called Copic. Okay. And you can buy refills for them. And so it's a liquid and it's actually an alcohol based ink. And you put it down on a non-porous paper, almost like a plastic paper. And then you use air, whether it's a hair dryer or your breath. And you can blow this ink around on the paper and you add alcohol to it. It's fascinating. And you can layer color up on top of color on top of color and create these beautiful, almost 3D effects. So I really got into that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that sounds like a fun process. Um, <laughs> and so messy work, too. Oh my gosh, that part would be harder for me. I'm not like a naturally like enjoys getting messy kind of person, but maybe if I set up the room the right way with like tablecloths and things. Okay. I have a big table with trash bags on top of it and then That's an open clever. so it, it protects everything. And then you're supposed to wear rubber gloves, but I never did that. So my fingers were always stained and that was kind of fun too. I was gonna say that's like you're that's a true yeah um, tell that you did something that's, that's right <laughs> and some of your works are behind you right now right is that with yeah, those they're just some big um pieces of alcohol ink and I just kind of tacked them up on the wall because again it's the color that speaks to me and just the different arrangements so I never will do anything with these pieces but they're just up there for me to look at I love that. No, they're, they're gorgeous. And it just makes the room so bright and tearful. And um, I think they'd make good wallpapers. Maybe we yeah, should. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would commission that. That's so cool. Um, so eventually, like your platform or your medium pivoted, right? Because we're going to be talking today about some of your work with postcards. How did that transition come about? Well, you know, I, I don't want to talk about COVID in a cliche way, but I think that the last, you know, 15 months for all of us, um, was challenging in so many ways mm -hmm. and I don't work outside of the home and I spent the beginning of the pandemic being very afraid and watching the television and I'm a science driven type of girl and I was horrified with what I was seeing how the, our country was being led or not being led and I, I would watch the ticker on the news, um, the death count in the United States. And I would shake, I would just sit in my living room and shake. And when the death count got to 200, I mean, imagine that, I, it, it seems forever ago, I had to do something. I had to do something with my hands. I had, I had to get some of this bad energy out, this, the, the absolute terror and anxiety that I was feeling. I happened to be at my mom's house one day and she was very crafty uh, back in the day. And she had a, a whole box of embroidery thread and I asked if I could have it. And of course I could, and I didn't know what to do with it. it I just, the, the colors again spoke to me. I'd never even thought about fiber or thread or yarn. So I came home and like you do, I get on Instagram and I start, you know, hashtagging, you know, embroidery thread. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, I've always thought of embroidery as being like samplers that you'd make for a child's bedroom. And there are people all over the world doing amazing things with thread or embroidery floss. And there was a woman in South America that I immediately was drawn to and she was taking images. And I believe they were family images, black and white photos. And she was embellishing them with thread and beads. And I thought, oh, I can do that. 
So I'd never threaded a needle before. I'd never sewn a button on a shirt. I bought some needles online. I um, went on Etsy and bought some postcards because I thought that would be fun. The idea of sewing on fabric would really made me uncomfortable because fabric moves and I wanted something, a firmer surface. So I loved the idea of a postcard. And so I bought these old postcards and I would sit in front of the television. All right. I've got a needle, <laughs> a little tiny you know, there's bleeding, um, and, and the punching through the paper, the postcard gave me such satisfaction. I loved the sound of it. When I would prick my finger and I'd bleed and I'd, I'd be amazed, you know, that I could do this. I mean, I wasn't, there was no self-harm intentionally right. here, but it was very satisfying to channel my anxiety and my energy on what was happening in the country and, and to dear, dear people who were losing their lives and that I was doing something productive. So I started sewing on these postcards and I would take images of people. I, I couldn't imagine why I had these images. You know, I, why do their families not have these pictures, right? I mean, why do I have this mm -hmm. darling young woman on a postcard in front of me. So I thought a lot about maybe what her story was and, and I would embellish her. I'd make her have fun hair or I'd, I'd work on her clothes some way, or I'd do a, a fun wallpaper background. So that's kind of how it started was just sheer anxiety and terror and needing to do something with my hands. Oh my gosh. I think our current theme here is just your response to like just situations you didn't ask for in right. ways that are really wholesome and good and, and bring about joy for not just you, but like other people who get to be part of them. And um, I think it was so clever to just start hashtag like searching embroidery. I mean, I like, I think so many of us are aware that you can use the hashtag as like a search function, but right. to actually see how that comes to fruition and like brings about your like ideation, I think that just, that came together really wonderfully. Um, so to use our social media for good is something yes, I love. Yes. Something I love. <laughs> and a way to connect with people when the world was just so in mm -hmm. their own corners, you found this um, appreciation for someone on a different continent and yes. got to, to re react to their work. Um, has that person got to see all the things that you've created? Yes. Um, we've actually corresponded, you know, ju just on like private messaging and stuff. And, and she's a lovely woman and she does amazing work and she uses so she uses beading and now she is even doing like some gold foil in her works. I mean, just really kind of taking it to another level, which, you know, kind of leads me to think, hmm, you know, what could I do, you know, in the future? Will I get bored with just sewing on postcards? But right now I probably have 200 of them here to do. So I'm going to stick with just what I'm doing right now and, and think about the future later. Even better when a friendship gets to come out of it. I think yes. that's so yes. special. Um, and what I love about the world of like just creative people, you know, I came from a business background and the school I went to was fiercely competitive. And there was some collaboration within that, but it was always like a little bit like proprietary and fear right. of like sharing. Whereas right. in this, um, what I'm finding, at least through these conversations, is that people are so eager to share their experiences and learn from each other. Um, and in, in the encouragement. Yes. It just really feeds your soul, especially when we're not, you know, all in person, that you can get kind comments from people that you don't know. And, and you feel like they're really genuine and you give the same back. So there is a real sense of community in that way. Yes. Oh, it's such a special community to be part of. Um, so you do have this website and it's something that I've really enjoyed looking at and admiring your works on. And it's called Hey Lady Art Studio, which is so fun. But I wanted to understand a little bit more about how that came to be. Um, again, it's about it's about fun and it's about learning and it's about not taking it too seriously. I think of art so much as you know something serious and you know great masters and and people who are really maybe trying to do this for a living and just serious and I'm not that serious I, I want to make mistakes I want to learn I want it to be fun and this dates me terribly but there's an old um 
oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking an old comedian, but he would do this, hey lady, kind of horrible voice. Jerry Lewis is his name. Oh, that's awesome. It just, it just seemed fun and funny. So I call myself, hey lady, art studio. And it's, you know, very tongue in cheek. That's so cool. Such a great history to be um, building off of. Um, that's amazing. And I'd love to, so now we can, I'll pull up my screen and we can look at some of your, your works, which is just, okay. I'm so excited to share them. They really stood out to me the first time I saw them. I'd never seen anything like this. So um, there's three different collections that you have right now, and I'd love to explore each of them. This one is the Amended Memories collection. Mm -hmm. um, so wherever you want to start with it, I just would love to hear a bit more about how you thought of the name, how you grouped them, like some background behind these pieces. Whatever. Yes, I do have the, the three different collections. One is Amended Memories, and those are the antique, the really, truly old, old postcards. Most of them are from the very early 1900s. And I call them Amended Memories because I am. I'm, I'm sort of altering someone else's memory, someone else's history and making it my own. Kind of, a, kind of adopting them. Um, these images are, are three totally different ones. Um, the gentleman with the exploding head. Exploding heads are, are kind of a recurrent theme. Um, they're a little twisted and wrong, but they can also be very whimsical and I can play with color. Uh, in this one, I use a very complimentary, you know, coloring, just shades in the same family. And you can see that he is holding, he's called detonation and he's holding his um, detonating threads. And he was really fun to do. I do a lot of exploding heads. Um, the middle girls, look at these ladies. They are, <laughs> they are so grim. Um, in my search for antique postcards, I do like to find people who are not traditionally attractive. Um, I like faces with a lot of personality, but these poor girls just seemed miserable. And I was working on them um, at Easter time. So I decided to make the one lady a really nice Easter bonnet, just in hopes of cheering her up. So <laughs> I love that. Have you ever, are you familiar with like the Easter parade in New York? Yes, I am. So like that would be a perfect, she would get photographed by everybody. It would really stand right, right, right. <laughs> That's and the last postcard, I believe, is uh, from Salzburg, Austria. And um, it was not my nod to Van Gogh story night, but just to sort of bring a subtle little bit of color to that beautiful evening sky. And I kind of used some pastels there. And it was fun to do just to create some circles. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I chose these ones at random because I thought they were a cool like diversity of like work within your collection. Um, but I know that from previous conversations, you spoke about how your craft has evolved as you've gone, right? You it started with maybe more imperfect sewing and started with like creepier things as, as you yeah. put it um, yeah. because of just the state of the, the world and how you were feeling. Were these all from a similar point in time or different points and like- No, actually these are some of the more recent things, things that I have done. Um, more recently in the last couple of months but yeah at first they the work started out of course I didn't know how to sew I didn't know any of these stitches I learned a few on watching YouTube videos um at first I I didn't mind making mistakes and they were a little uh, rougher and now I'm trying to be a little more deliberate in a technique and, and I'm, I'm trying harder I guess is what I'm saying and I think it shows. I still love the ones I did in the beginning. I turned a lot of children into devils and cats and monkeys <laughs> and, and bears. And those were really fun. Uh, but, but now I'm getting a little more technical, maybe. Yeah, a good part. It's all part of the evolution, which yes. is really <laughs> special. No, I, I love these ones. Um, and the color is just such an important part of what mm -hmm. makes them so special. So this is the National Park series, which is also very cool, um, especially yeah. the hair in the middle, but I want to hear about all of it. Um, my husband and I, even through um, the pandemic, we did take some road trips very, very safely, you know, packing coolers, kind of, kind of not living out of the car, but really laying low. And um, we thought a wonderful place to go would be to um, South Dakota. I mean, who goes to South Dakota? Not many people. And it was beautiful. And of course, the national parks, they were open, but only to a certain extent. But I found my first national card, 
post national park postcards uh, at Badlands. And um, so they prairie dogs there. So I made the mother prairie dog with an exploding head. We went to Mount Rushmore. You know, I thought those guys need a little makeover. So I just, we just had some fun with their hair. And then that led me to finding the company that makes these postcards. It's a design firm out of Nashville. And so I bought their complete national park series because I'm a parks person. And so I've started um, embellishing and embroidering on all of the national parks. And it's really fun. The one here that you've chosen is the Smoky Mountains. And I found that while I love embroidery, like doing special little stitches and French knots and little X's and chains and stuff, I love the geometric um, embroidery too. Uh, when I was little, we used to do string art. And so this is reminiscent of that. There's a lot of math involved in rulers and it's very painstaking, but very, very satisfying in a different type of way. So I have a lot of geometric work in my, in my collections. So you got the postcards first and then like, I, I think that each of the designs is so perfectly suited to the card that it's on, but how much like thought had to go into that? Or was it, you just, you saw it and you knew that that like stars geometric kind of situation was perfect for that. Like, what's that like? Some, sometimes it happens right away. Most of the time I need to sit with a postcard for months. I have a collection of about 15 on my desk right now that I look at multiple times a day. And I think, what is the story? How do I want to carry it forward? What colors would I use? And so most of the time it doesn't come immediately. It, it takes quite a while to find the inspiration. Once I've got it, I can knock these dudes out, but it does take a while to get there. Uh, and I think patience with the process, with everything is probably so important. I know that for me, like I have to be very intentional to remember to be patient with processes, <laughs> but I feel like that would maybe come naturally for you. Does that, do you feel? No, not at all. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a pretty energetic um, jump from one project to the next type of person in my real life. So I have had to literally slow down and pay attention, listen to myself, close the door, turn off the television, and just think and be. And that's where the patience comes in. I, I should probably learn to meditate. I think that'd be very helpful. I think you might already be meditating. That sounds pretty <laughs> meditative. In my own way, but not, not in an official capacity. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I think that's another really like therapeutic part of the process is that it does force you to, or encourage you to, to take a moment and just like yes. take everything in. Um, I like that. I, this is another like exploding head example, right on the Badlands one. That's, yes. um, that's so cool. And the Badlands is a, a special one to me. Like this is an aside, but my sister and I've always wanted to go to the Badlands. And you said like, not a lot of people go to South Dakota and it's been so, I've been so close to it, but like never able to like actually <sighs> go and my sister was on a road trip and she was like had the opportunity to go but she refused she knew that her big sister would be a little bit peeved if she didn't wait for me so she waited for me so my sister and I are waiting to go to the badlands um together and we'll have to try to find a postcard like that when we do or send you a picture <laughs> absolutely no it, it was a fascinating place absolutely fascinating it looks so cool just out of this world um but capturing it in these new ways too is just so exciting um so then this one is from the Wish You Were Here collection. Yes, I um, love postcards from you know Americana. Uh, these are linen postcards and most of them are from the 30s, 40s and 50s. And I bought a number of them and I just love the way they feel that with the linen in them, they, they almost have a fabric feel I, I, it's hard to describe but they're very satisfying to sew on and this particular one uh, was about pioneers going into Utah and because of the art well you, you, I just had to do a rainbow and I tried a new stitch it's called a chain stitch I've never done it again this was the first time I'd ever done this stitch but also you're showing the back of the postcard which I think the backs are sometimes as beautiful and fascinating as the fronts um, be because I don't know how to sew, I, I don't know how to finish 
something. I, I, I think that I don't know how to do a knot that would be appropriate. So I usually just let the threads kind of hang and then I put bandage tape over them. And I use bandage tape. It's kind of silly. My husband's a physician and we have bandage tape in the house. But I also feel like I have harmed these postcards in some ways, especially the people. I, I truly have damaged them. When you put a needle through the paper, you can never undo that. So it's just my way of being kind and repairing the damage I've made. So I use bandage tape. It's silly, but it works for me. It makes me feel better. Oh, and also I have to say <laughs> that anytime I um, sew on a postcard of a human being, I take a before picture of it. I have this fear <laughs> that someone's going to come after me and say, that was my grandmother. And so I, uh, you know, I said, it's okay. It's okay. I've got an original image, you know, before I totally jacked her hair up. So <laughs> that's, that's also amazing. Oh, incredibly thoughtful. And I, I think <laughs> that the whole thing is like, just very poetic. Um, you know, the use of the medical tape is like personal to your family and your experience with your husband's um, work. But I think too, like, if I abstract it to just like life and our journeys, like there are things we go through that um, in the moment, like hurt us, like an indentation on a, a piece of paper would change the paper forever. But when you look at the front side of it, then too, like it transforms it, like it becomes a new thing entirely. And that's kind of, that's ultimately really beautiful. Um, so I think you get to see the whole picture of just the lived experience here. Right. It's just not sewing. There is a lot more that goes into it. And, and that's fun to talk about. And you're the very first person that I really ever talked with about the whole process and what it means. So, I'm oh my gosh, it means so much to me. Um, so, and I, I chose to put the back on this screen too, because I, it was crazy to me when I realized I hadn't thought at all about like what the other side looks like. Like you see mm -hmm. the beautiful front and you just like, I don't know, I hadn't thought at all about how that manifests and it's um, sewn. So obviously there's a, a backside to it. Um, when people um, buy these postcards or when you keep them for yourself and display them, how do you see them incorporated into people's homes and lives? Well, again, I hope people are drawn to the color and maybe maybe the whimsical nature of it. I, I They're small pieces because they're postcard size. So you know, I envision them in a, in a small space, maybe in a small thoughtful space. I, and I don't know, I've, I've had several people that have had them framed because I sell everything unframed. And I have one collector who has them framed and up on a bookshelf with a bunch of very colorful books. And it's a really nice combination of books and sewing. That's so cool. It has me thinking about in my own house, where would I put one of these postcards? And I feel like it would be a really sweet, like element of surprise in a corner where you're like not expecting something or like on an otherwise even plain wall, just to have something that your eye gravitates toward. Um, it's very, it would be special in any place you put it. Um, I was also really interested in your shop because I feel like a lot of um, people who are engaged in crafts will choose Etsy as the place to post their work. But you have your own standalone website. And I wondered if that was a intentional decision or something that just kind of happened and how you navigate. Also, I mean, this is a business um, too. Well, it's barely a business. Um, I, I need to learn a lot about running a business. I, I buy my postcards from Etsy and I buy a lot of my embroidery Loss, especially any metallics um, from people in England. And I love the, the silk threads and I buy everything on Etsy, but it never occurred to me that I could sell on Etsy. And, but how the website came about, uh, the Northwest Arkansas Girl Gang, it's a, it's a wonderful community. Mm -hmm. um, they were going to have an online sale last year and they asked for people to sign up and I thought oh I can do online you know I'm not doing anything in person but that would be fun and maybe people would like to see these so I filled out the application and the very last question was 
he, I need a link to your website. And I thought, well, whoops, I don't have one. So I scrapped the application. A few days later, um, I saw where the same organization was accepting applications for a scholarship to have a website built. And oh, I jumped on that. And I said, I'm an old lady and I don't, I don't know anything <laughs> about computers. And I mean, which was so true, um, but they did. They chose me and a company out of the goodness of their hearts built me a website and trained me how to use it as a selling platform. And it's been very successful and very easy to navigate. And I won't use anything else because I'm so grateful to have this and it works. It's gorgeous. I mean, it's just, it's so professional, well-organized, easy to navigate, and all the things you can ask for. And I know how to change it, which is the amazing thing. Even I could learn how to do this. That is so cool. Something I so admire in what you do, Jen, is like leaning into different opportunities. Like, um, and you mentioned to me, um, you promised you, and this is like almost a direct quote, like you promised yourself that you would embrace opportunities this year, whether they scared you or not. And there's a few right. incredible examples of that the NWA girl gang being one of them. Um, but I wondered if you could talk about the place I interacted with you first or encountered your work, which was the Arkansas Arts Council and how that came to be. Yes, and it was kind of an odd story. Uh, again, I followed them on Instagram um, mm -hmm. because I tried to follow local types of things. And, and I think that they do really nice work. And they had like one of these call for artists. You know, we're doing a women's art event online. Send us your work. Well, I didn't know what to send. I don't have an artist statement. I, I, I don't know what people like. So I just responded in an email and I said, here's what I do. Thanks. See ya. And the day of the event was really wild. I got an email back from a lovely woman and she said, you're in, you know, watch it. And so I did, I tried to watch some of it online and it, and it was a, a lovely program. I was just busy doing other things and I, I never saw, you know, my work during the program, but I was very grateful and honored that um, they included some of my postcards and that's, I guess, where you saw me. <laughs> Yes, it was. Um, I, I definitely encourage anyone to check out the Arkansas Arts Council events. I've had the privilege of interviewing two of the, the leaders over there, and they're just so motivated to advocate for artists and work alongside them. And um, yeah, your stuff definitely caught my eye. And the whole Women's History um, just production that they put on was really powerful and meaningful and all the good stuff. Um, you've also had some really special collaborations and features of your work um, locally. So one of my favorite pizzerias in Northwest Arkansas, which is like so much more than a pizzeria even, is Oven and Tap. And your work is are currently on display there. Is that that right? You could speak to maybe how that happened? Yes, um, that was pretty early in the process of last summer. Um, these wonderful people, Dylan Turk and Christy Turk, who have a small curating firm, it's called Curated by Kin, um, noticed what I was doing. And they generously had many of my postcards framed and they have been on display uh, in Oven and Tap, a wonderful restaurant. I mean, even <laughs> I thought oh, I'm good. their food. And so my art is on display in the bar area and it has been since last October. I believe it'll be switched out soon with another artist, but it's been an amazing opportunity. And, and the very first real tangible thing that happened for me making these postcards oh my gosh no it's so cool and I think just um I'd encourage people whenever they go to local businesses to look at this the decor and the art because so often it is from local people mm -hmm. who are doing incredible things and uh the oven and tap example with your work is one of those really great examples um but the trajectory kept growing from there so oven and tap you mentioned was um, a little bit while back. And then, you know, our, our favorite little museum in our backyard, Crystal Bridges, knocked on your door. Um, and I don't think many people get to say that. So what was that experience like? Um, horrifying. <laughs> so, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a lady who sews postcards and um, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art is it truly in my backyard. I walk the grounds every single day. I visit as often as I can, even during COVID, that's been one place that I have actually 
you know, gone inside. Yes. And I got an email and they were interested in me doing a, an online program called Art by the Glass, which combines art and a cocktail on a Friday evening. And uh, how could I say no? I was so, so honored. And it was also during their, their latest exhibit called Crafting in America, which just meant the absolute world to me. So I did an online class and there were scads of people from all over the country and, and some from around the world. And we sewed and laughed and they asked questions and I asked questions and it was just a beautiful experience. Oh my gosh. I hope that we get to have a second iteration of that at some point, because I'd love to be in that audience or in that group where uh, the, the work is happening. That's so special. Um, and then were you involved in another gallery, maybe in Seattle as well? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't even know how this happens. <laughs> I'm not soliciting. I'm not out there. And of course, with everybody being, you know, not in person, you know, I'm not out there peddling anything and I don't know how I get found sometimes, but this lovely woman from an art gallery in Seattle has asked me to be part of a group show of uh, mixed media artists uh, later on this year. And I just am blown away by that opportunity. So not only am I, I'm making the postcards and I'm selling them, I'm actually showing them in venues that I never even dreamed of was not an aspiration it's just happened and so I'm um, saying bring it on wow and I mean I just think it's so special how they are just like they're coming up so organically um yes. and clearly you're doing something that is right and that's resonating with a lot of people myself included um and I'm so glad that it's spanning the country and the world and all the places um that get to benefit from it have you been to Seattle yet or would this be your first time if you get to visit for the gallery I have been to Seattle only once a number of years ago but my husband and I are planning a trip with National Park people and Olympic National Park has been our number one go-to so we are working very hard planning a, a hardcore trip um, to the west coast where we're start we'll start in Seattle and kind of go into California but I'm really excited about that that's going to be incredible. Seattle is a really cool city. I was there one Super Bowl weekend, I remember, and there was no Super Bowl playing locally. But I just remember that people were watching it on the screens, but all the markets and the arts there are just going to be so special to be a part of. Um, yeah. it's really exciting. So we talked about so many different aspects of your work and how it comes together, um, but I, I wanted to take a little bit of a broader approach now and just say, you know, like, why does creativity and be like an engagement in crafts. So why does it matter? Do you think, what is them? What is it meant for you? What do you think it could mean for other people? Well, I, I think for me, it means an opportunity to express myself um, in, in a traditional way, but not necessarily in a way that I'm comfortable with. So I love the learning process. I love, um, putting my foot out there and, and trying something different and something new. And art and craft is a way to do that. Um, I think traditional crafts are really being celebrated now. We have so many wonderful craft schools throughout the country that are teaching you know, traditional arts. And in this digital age, I think people may forget how to use their hands. And I'm talking about, you know, everything from basket weaving, you know, you know, to pottery, anything to use our hands. And I think it's just always going to be important to celebrate art and craft. Yes, I had a, a manager once who told me something similar about how this um, upcoming generation, like, is really actually craving those more tactile opportunities. Because if you just have a computer, myself included, like, I don't take notes on paper anymore. I feel like my handwriting has gotten so much worse just because I'm not using my hands Right. in all the ways they were intended. Like, I don't even really cook. Like, I really need to get into those more hands-on experiences and, and crafting is such a, a good way to flex that that muscle um, right. and also relax and, and all the good good things. And have fun. Um, <laughs> have fun, yes. Um, something else I'd, I'd like to ask you along those lines is, Jan, like, what has been a really great learning for you along the way? This came about in as a result of a time that was um, in, it's just incredibly difficult and sad and, and it's become something so joyful for everyone um, who gets to interact with your work um, but what has been a lesson in it for you 
the lesson has been to be patient. And like you had mentioned earlier, just to let things happen organically. If what you're doing is true, if it's meaningful and true to who you are and fun, then good things will happen. And you have to be a little patient and sit back and sit with it and let it happen. And that's the greatest lesson for me is just not to be so spastic and <laughs> really breathe it in and enjoy every single moment of it. I, I love that idea. And as I'm um, like currently a student, as you know, and like just rushing through life in so many right. ways, I could really personally use the reminder um, to embrace the patience and the why of what we're doing and what we're hoping to get out of it um, are all so central <laughs> to why we're doing it in the first place. Um, Jen, what would you like people to leave knowing about you and your work when they see your postcards and, and all that stuff? What should they be reminded of? Oh, I don't, fun, color, uh, opportunity. Um, you can make something out of anything. You can take an old black and white discarded image and revamp it, zhuzh it up a little bit, have some fun and send it on to a new home where in a hundred years, it'll probably be sold on some platform and somebody will say, what in the world is this? And how can I do something with it. So it's a never ending process that I'm just one little piece of. Uh, that's um, so important always to remember how we're part of that bigger yeah. system and that bigger equation. And also to zhuzh something up is like one of my favorite <laughs> concepts of things. And I haven't heard it in such a long time. So thank you. That was a very like, I feel like in New York, I've heard that term a lot, but I haven't heard right, it right. a while here. So I wanted to zhuzh up everything today. I want everything to be fun and <laughs> seen as an opportunity and all those great things. Um, and finally, Jen, there's so many things that we've mentioned that you're, I'm sure, looking forward to, but anything in particular that you're looking forward to in the near or long future? Oh, my, so much. I mean, there's everything to look forward to. Uh, next week, I just happened to be taking a trip to Nashville, and I found that there's a real live embroidery shop, and I'm going to go inside of it. It'll be my first time inside of a shop that sells the items that I use and I'm probably going to go for Zirko. Super excited about that. I look forward to international travel. I haven't been on a plane in 15 months and I just really need to go. I love a road trip, but I need to get on a plane. Yes. Th okay. Those are two really fun things that I'm looking forward to. Oh, I'm so excited to follow your adventures on your social media. I hope you'll be posting about this embroidery shop and any travels you get to do. And Jan, it's been such a pleasure. Like truly, this brought so much joy to my day. And I so appreciate you sharing your story and your work on this platform. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I hope to do things like this again. I hope to meet other people that do the same thing. I mean, that would, that would be my greatest joy. And to give you a hug. I'd love to do that. I can't wait for the day you hear me post it. Thank you so much.